You're now listening to the Adiel Gorel Show. Each episode, I'll bring you the latest news for my discussions with top health and wellness experts so that you can bring yourself into better health. Today on the Adiel Gorel Show. Excess carbs are giving us excess sugar, and we know that sugar is destructive for the neurons, and it's also destructive for the blood vessels, and, you know, a factor with diabetes and heart disease and kidney disease. So also everybody pretty much talks about avoid eating maybe three hours before bedtime, but can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so um, when, uh, it, it can actually impair your sleep um, because you're, if you're eating right before bed, then your, your digestion is busy working on digesting the food and something happens with you know, that going on that people will not be sleeping as deeply. So, um, you know, protecting the sleep and the sleep phases is really important. Now, can all people fast two or three hours before bed? No, you know, there's, there's no one size fits all and everything. I don't, you know, think people should follow anything religiously. Um, some people like myself, I have low blood sugar and I've done, and uh, we'll be doing this in the next study, but you can get a continuous glucose monitor, which is a little round device that you put on the back of your arm for two weeks and it tracks your blood sugar for two weeks and and that's a fascinating way to learn about how different foods are raising your blood sugar and how quickly does it come down and uh and it can show us i know in my own case it showed me that during the night my blood sugar was way too low and and i actually will sleep better if i have a little snack before bed um so Again, no one size fits all, but for most people, they will sleep better if they stop eating a couple of hours before bed. Now, let's just drill down for a second about the grain-free. I mean, I know that there's going to be a lot of noise here mm -hmm. saying, what? You mean, what kind of grains? What are you talking about? Is it just wheat? Is it just gluten? Can I eat rice? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, yes. Um, so um, grains are carbs and carbs are sugars. So I tell my patients, see this equation in your brain, carbs equal sugar. So if you eat the carbs, they turn right into sugar. We know that sugar is not good for us. You know, of course we need some carbs. I mean, we need some balance of carbs and fats and protein. Um, so uh, it's not a zero carb diet, but excess carbs are giving us excess sugar. And we know that sugar is destructive for the neurons and it's also destructive for the blood vessels and you know a factor with diabetes and heart disease and kidney disease. So, so we wanna minimize the sugars. And then, um, the, so the grains are all high in sugar. Now you take a grain like rice, rice is kind of intermediate. It's not as high in carbs and sugar as the grains but it still has an inflammatory component for people. And, and um, it's also, I'm trying to remember, it's arsenic or cadmium. I get them mixed up. Um, it's arsenic. It's arsenic. 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 No. Yes, it can be, it can be, it takes it up naturally from the soil and, and rice from some areas is better than others. So I believe the rice from Thailand and from Louisiana was better than, you know, some of the other rices, but I've definitely seen people with high arsenic and they stop eating the rice and the arsenic comes down. But I'll just tell you a little story. When I was really sick and allergic to everything and tested all of my allergies, I was allergic to all kinds of grains, very allergic to gluten, a lot of other grains, but I wasn't allergic to rice. And so I ate rice and I ate it every day. I'm a Cajun girl. I grew up in Southern Louisiana. We eat a lot of rice. And then I went to my first paleo conference some years ago, and they were showing the data of the paleo diets and, and how beautiful it was for people's health and all of these different metabolic markers. And I said, you know what, I'm already eating paleo except for the rice. So I'm going to give up my rice. And I eat a lot of curries and stir fry dishes, and I would have the rice and eat it with a fork. So I said, okay, I'll eat my curries and stir fries with a spoon instead of a fork because I won't have the rice. And what I noticed after about two weeks um, was that my body changed. And I felt like when I would feel my body, I just felt lean muscle. And 
before when eating the rice, I had this layer of just kind of pudge or softness in my body. And it wasn't weight. I wasn't overweight. I didn't lose weight. I didn't need to lose weight, but something perceptibly changed in my body that felt like I had decreased inflammation from, from not eating the rice. So since that time, many years ago, I have stayed off of that, but it, they, they, and also the grains tend to be fairly, and there's not a lot of phytonutrients in grains, you know, compared to fruits and vegetables where you're going to just get all of these, you know, beautiful nutrients, but people, we, by nature, we use our grains as fillers. And, and so, you know, between being inflammatory for some people being allergic, the toxins that are sprayed on the grains, um, we just find it's better to have people, I mean, at a minimum to stay off the of gluten because we know the gluten destroys the lining of the gut. Well, you know, when you were mentioning the curry dishes, the mind conjures a picture of the curry swimming in rice. I mean, yeah. definitely. But I understand we can overcome that. Where do you put um, beans? Yeah, so beans are in the class of legumes and lectins. And um, there are some people like Dr. Stephen Gunner who say, okay, nobody should be eating lectins and legumes. Um, I disagree with that. I think they're hard to digest. And so if you have a lot of GI issues that we're working with, constipation or bloating or gas or things like that, it's probably better to avoid something like beans while we heal the gut. And then after the GI functioning is good, then um, I think you want to just be sure that the things like beans, are, you know, or uh, lentils or things are they're, they're soaked or cooked well enough so that you can digest them. They can just be hard to digest. I mean, there's there's many cultures that you know beans and legumes are a staple of their diet, and I think I always look to if somebody has a clear heritage in their ancestral diet, then you know, that means that they have evolved for centuries to eat that particular diet. So I'm not willing to say they're all bad, just that they're hard to digest. And so you want to get your digestive functioning working optimally. And then, you know, just don't make it a, a staple of your diet, because again, that they're carby and they come then at the expense of we eat less vegetables if we eat more carbs and really what we need are those vegetables. Some people have a GI response, not just to beans, but also to certain veggies, like maybe uh, broccoli, uh, cauliflower, things like that. Yeah, I, I suspect that that is often, um, I mean, uh, the sulfora veins can be, uh, they can, you know, cause gas for people. And so I think um, it's a sign sometimes, again, that people's digestive function isn't optimal. One thing that's important to know is we lose our digestive enzymes with aging. I mean, there's so many things we lose with aging, right? You know, we, we weren't told, but, you know, now we know aging isn't for sissies. And, and so one of the first things that we lose, uh, the, our hydrochloric acid that, that comes in our stomach. I mean, our first First, our, our salivary glands secrete enzymes to help break down the food, and then it goes into our stomach, and then we secrete hydrochloric acid. And that really can go away with age. So a lot of people with digestive problems can just get a, a supplement, and they're an inexpensive supplement called betaine hydrochloride, or just HCL for short, if you Google HCL supplements, and, and take that at the start of the meal, take a couple, um, that can help to start breaking down your food. And so um, a lot, because if we can't break down our food properly, one, we can't extract the nutrients, but also then the food can sit in our gut and it can ferment in a bad way. And, and then it all comes to the whole microbiome and, and what's happening with the mix of bacteria in our gut, because they're controlling all kinds of things in our body and brain. So um, so that's my thought of, you know, when people are not tolerating vegetables like that, that perhaps they need HCL and sometimes people need to take a general digestive enzyme as well. Well, you know, one thing that um, is mentioned a lot in our podcast, many experts in many, many fields, breathing, nitric oxide, everything, talk about the importance of something that many of us most of all, myself, are very guilty of not doing, and that is 
chewing our food very well and slowly. Yeah. <laughs> Digestion starts in the mouth and I'm guilty as well. I grew up in a big family with seven kids and you ate fast so you could get the seconds, right? And I am constantly catching myself at this phase in my life and reminding myself to chew. So I think that's such such an important point. And, and, you know, we're also trained eat on the run, you know, put some food in our mouth while we're running out the door. And really the more we can sit down and be in a peaceful place and calm so that we can chew and, and savor our food and digest our food, um, that would help all of us. But you know, it, it occurs to me that modern life really tries to fight that because Many people are so used to quick stimulation all the time on your phone. You got a beep, you got an email, you got a this. So to sit quietly, not reading anything, not looking at your phone, because most people do it with their phones or the TV, sounds almost excruciating. I think the way it was not excruciating back in the day is when you ate, it was a social experiment. Yes, and we talk social about experience, it. rather. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know. And I think it's hard the way things have evolved. Families don't eat together anymore. You know, we all have different schedules and we're doing too many things. So, you know, none of us, I think, are going to be perfect in that. But the more we can be aware and definitely to be calm, you know, to... And if you're going to be looking at your cell phone, don't look at stressful stuff, right? That's the thing. I heard that, too, just recently from a very, very incredible nutritionist. She said, listen, if you're so used to reading, read, but read something pleasant and fun, not the news or, you know, stuff like right. that. Right. I'm going to take a big jump off to the side. And you, in your study, you also tested for uh, infections. Right. And you mentioned several names of viruses and other, uh, you know, entities. Let's start with the viruses. Yeah. So you mentioned, uh, you know, Epstein-Barr and cytomegalovirus, which I don't know the percentage of the population that has those, mostly dormant, but I believe it's quite high. So if we stop right there with these two viruses, and do you know the percentage of the population that carries those viruses? Uh, not precisely. And I, I would say the top two viruses would be um, uh, the herpes virus and the Epstein-Barr virus. So cytomegalovirus is not quite as prevalent as those two. But with herpes and herpes simplex one are the cold sores. And many of those, many of us get that in childhood. I believe it's in the high 80 percentile, at least, that that of those of us that carry herpes simplex one. I have found a few people I've tested that don't have it, but the majority of people I test have, have herpes simplex one. And, and there's some uh, beautiful large scale data um, studies done by a researcher, Dr. Ruth Izaki, and she looked at, I don't know, 30,000 people or more and found that, uh, and was looking at herpes and she found that if people were treated for herpes at some point in their life, if they took a single course of an antiviral drug, that their risk of getting dementia was greatly reduced. Interesting. And, yes, and we, we've long known that um, when people die with, with Alzheimer's, that um, they have found lots of herpes, more herpes in the brains of Alzheimer's deaths than non-Alzheimer's deaths. So there was it's been long known that there was a correlation with herpes. So we know that many of these viruses have a proclivity to live in our brain. And with the viruses, what happens, and people are learning about this, it's the same thing with COVID, but we don't usually completely eradicate them. It's just that our immune system puts a lid on them and keeps them from replicating. And then when we have times that our immune system is not functioning well, then the viruses can wake up and reactivate and start causing problems again. And we see that people that have recurrent cold sores or herpes, no, okay, it goes away, it comes back uh, kind of thing. So, um, so it, we just, we, we believe that, I mean, first off, we want to keep the organism healthy so the immune system works so that these viruses don't reactivate. But sometimes they are reactivated, in which case, 
we believe that it's helpful to treat those viruses to knock down the viral load to a level that your own immune system then can keep that lid on it and, and keep them from being a problem. And um, the Epstein-Barr virus has been in the news recently. It's only been recently uh, discovered that um, almost all cases of multiple sclerosis are being linked to the Epstein-Barr virus. And Epstein-Barr virus is mononucleosis, the kissing disease that many teenagers get. Um, it's also called, it can lead to chronic fatigue. So we know that uh, Epstein-Barr is something we always want to look at with people suffering from chronic fatigue. And so that's another one that in traditional medicine, we were just taught, well, there are viruses, we really don't have treatments for them. But it turns out that there are treatments for these things now with a herpes virus, there are medications approved, valocyclovir and acyclovir are common medicines that people are given for outbreaks. And some people are given them chronically, they're approved to take all the time if you have recurrent outbreaks of herpes. So um, there's, there's people looking, I know, I, I don't know if they finished the study or not, but I found that Columbia, was doing a study looking at using valacyclovir, treating people for 18 months for dementia. And I don't think that just treating the herpes is going to reverse the dementia. I think all those other factors that I mentioned have to be dealt with as well. But I do think that it can help. And so, you know, and if I find people with high levels of herpes virus, I'm definitely going to recommend that they, you know, consider going on medication for a period of months to see if we can decrease that load. Okay, so you check, but you know, see how it all weaves back together. Keeping a strong immune system, meaning sleeping well, eating right, doing all the good things that we said. Yeah. Whatever viruses you have will keep them at bay too. And of course, it all feeds into, you know, the other. I'm, I'm going to jump. Well, no, let's talk about, you talked about Lyme disease that you check for. Yes. Now, from the Lyme disease expert that we interviewed, I have to say it sounds very bleak. Uh, can you talk about it a little bit? Well, I think the bleakness comes from, again, trying to do one thing. Like if you're just giving antibiotics and antimicrobials for the Lyme disease, I think it can be bleak. But if you do all these other things that you just mentioned, eat right, sleep right, reduce your stress, get all your vitamins right, you know, get all your blood sugar under control. You to just treat anything in a vacuum, I have come to see is not the answer, right? We have a complex system of physiology and biochemistry, and we need to get everything working. So if you're just going to treat someone with antimicrobials for Lyme, they might have a harder time getting better. But I definitely see people get better from Lyme and from neurocyte Lyme. I've had people that come in and they, you know, have to conduct the interview with them laying on the exam table because they're too weak to sit up. I have to close the blinds because they can't handle the light. And I, I know I have several young people that were like that that are now, you know, got back into college. One of them's finished college. I mean, these were, you know, youngsters that couldn't even go to school. So it can get better. Um, I think it's, it's not that bleak, but it, it's a tough disease. And, um, you know, there's different levels of how sick people get with Lyme. I say there's Lyme in little letters and Lyme in capital letters, you know, and so there's, there's a whole spread of, of what we see with that disease. But Lyme is a spirochete just like syphilis. And, you know, we know that syphilis gets into the brain. Syphilis starts as a sexually transmitted disease, but 20 years down the road, the people that had it can become demented. And um, Lyme can certainly do the same thing and it can do it more quickly. And I also see that Lyme, when it's in the brain, disrupts the hormone levels. So you'll see young people, young men come in, their testosterone should be at the top of the range and, and it's in the toilet. So, um, so definitely, uh, 
I think many of the factors that we're looking at here in general with reversing dementia can be useful for Lyme. But, you know, as the climate change has, has been escalating, um, we see that the spread of Lyme is, is getting quite dramatic. And it's definitely in a lot of places that it used to not be. Um, I live in the San Francisco East Bay area. And I know that in California, we have Lyme has been found in every county of California. So it's much more prevalent along the North Coast area, um, but it's it's everywhere. And of course, people travel and there's different strains of Lyme and the traditional testing um, that's done like by Quest and LabCorp, it's only testing for a certain kind of strain and it may not be testing for all the strains. So a lot of times people will get tested by their primary care doctor and say, they'll say, no, you don't have Lyme and they very well may have Lyme. So um, you know, properly getting it. The, the testing is tricky for a lot of reasons, and it can be expensive to do that testing out of pocket. Um, so that sort of limits things for people to sometimes get the diagnosis. But it's not all bleak. And there was a good study that came out of Johns Hopkins. Now it's been almost two years. And they looked at, they compared the traditional antibiotics used to treat Lyme and, and they uh, tested against a lot of different herbals that are used to treat Lyme. And they found that with chronic Lyme, the herbal treatments were superior to any of the medications. Very interesting. Yes, it's a great study. And, uh, and then, it, you know, they said which ones. And the one that came out that was able to completely eradicate the Lyme persisters, because if Lyme can persist and can be hard to get rid of, just like the viruses, um, was a, a, an herbal called cryptolepis. And cryptolepis is the nastiest tasting stuff, I tell you. But I tell my patients, okay, just think of it like magical thinking. You're, it's, it's a liquid. You're, you know, take, swallowing it. And I just say, tell yourself, okay, this is getting rid of my Lyme. This is going to help me to get well, you know, to make it worthwhile to, to take it. But um, so that's a very interesting herb. It's a, a broad spectrum antimicrobial that is very good with Lyme. For our listeners, how do you spell that? Yeah. that? So crypto, C-R-Y-P-T-O, oh, well. and then lepis, L-E-P-I-S. Oh, easy enough. And crypto is a word that everybody knows by now. Right. So that's easy enough. Now, if I jump over to dental health, which was part of your protocol. Yeah. I mean, what, what do you think of the notion that a lot of adults have had their wisdom teeth pulled, so they think that area is completely clear and turns out, at least according to some a type of dentists and doctors, where they extracted the wisdom teeth below lie a treasure trove of all kinds of bad stuff, including viruses. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. And spirochetes and- you know, Many things, yeah. It's, it's actually more of an issue with root canal teeth. So um, with the wisdom teeth, for most people that isn't a problem, but occasionally people will get what's called a cavitation and, and they can have you know an infection in the socket of that tooth. And those can be very difficult to treat. But root canals are the, the big alarm, you know, that goes off in my mind for people. When we get a root canal, when we have an infection in our tooth, right, and they can't get it under control, they say, okay, well, we're gonna, you know, clean out the root and take it out. So they clean out your root, and the problem is beyond that root are these microtubules, little tiny tubules, and they say there's like miles of them in each tooth, like, you know, lots and lots of these microtubules. And so you had an infection, and that infection can track up into those microtubules. And then they take out the root, and they fill your tooth, and it's dead now because the root's gone, you no longer feel any pain. So you could have an occult or hidden infection in those microtubules, but you won't feel it. But those infections will trigger our immune system as they should, and they can keep the immune system turned on and they can track anything in the mouth and the nose can track easily into the brain. There's a porous plate that, um, that things can travel up and blood vessels travel up and, and so um, infections, when they get in the brain, are triggering the immune system, the microglia in the brain, 
to create inflammation, to kill the infection, but that inflammation going on for chronic periods will start to kill the brain cells as well and cause dementia. So what I am doing these days is for people that have root canals, I ask them to get a cone beam CAT scan. So it's a CAT scan, but it's a cone beam that's zeroed in on the teeth. And yeah, there's some of the orthodontists now have them in their offices. And um, here in, in the Bay Area, there's a series of uh, there's some dental radiology clinics that I send people to that have the latest equipment, but you get a CAT scan and then they look at the integrity of the root. So when you see that on the x-ray, it should be a line for the root, just a clear line. But if the line starts to get fuzzy, it's a sign that it might de be degenerating and there might be a hidden infection in there. And, you know, we've just had, you know, clinically lots of stories of people that had chronic immune problems and then they decide to pull their root canal teeth and almost overnight they get better. I had happened to somebody I know and she said, I had such severe fatigue for two years and then I pulled my root canal teeth and I just recovered like almost instantly. What advice would you give to one of our viewers or listeners who, and I know people who might have had a root canal, the same one, that's yeah. 20 years old, 25 years old, and yeah. the person is an athlete and energetic, feeling good. So, I mean, what would, should they just leave it be? Yeah, I, I think it's worthwhile to have a look and get a cone beam CAT scan. <laughs> And just look at the integrity. I have I have three root canals, and um, I, you know, because I've already had dementia, and you know, definitely don't want to ever go back to that. I go every two years and just get another cone beam CAT scan to keep looking and making sure. And I have them read by a dental radiologist, and I make sure that that they still look intact. And if they did show signs of degeneration, then I would be faced with pulling them. And when you pull them, what would you do? What would you put there instead? Right. Well, people would, you, then you have to have an implant or a bridge. And um, I really definitely prefer that people go and work with biologic dentists that have understanding of these kind of infections. Many of them will use things like ozone. So um, ozone is very toxic for the microbes. So they can treat the area with ozone to you know, kill things. And people are trying to develop safer root canals now. I mean, it's, you know, it's a useful treatment not to lose a tooth, uh, but uh, they're doing things now with lasers, endolase, I believe it's the name of one of them. There's a couple of them now that they can laser inside that root to clean it better. And then they can put ozone in there to further try to kill everything and get up into those microtubules. And so, um, so trying to find safer ways to do root canals, you know, if you're going to do them um, is, the, is the way to go, I would say. Um, because yeah, it's not, it's not easy to lose teeth. But if I see somebody, I, I had a patient that I had kept her dementia. She came to me already with moderate dementia and we kept it stable for quite a few years. And then suddenly she started to decline. So I said, okay, let me go back to the drawing board. You know, let's look at everything again. Let's test everything again. And I said, now, have I ever uh, recommended that you get a cone beam CAT scan? And I was told, oh, she just had one. And she has like, you know, two teeth that are infected. And they wanted to do root canals. And in that situation, I said, oh my goodness, her brain is already so compromised and we see her declining. And I feel like this could be an important reason because, because you know, they were doing everything right with the protocol and she had been doing well for so many years. Uh, and so I felt like it would be better in that case to just pull those teeth rather than doing a root canal. But you know, it's a tough thing to pull a teeth and it's expensive to get, you know, an implant and, you know. And the implant is not trouble free on its own. Yeah. So, I mean, what I've learned with implants is that it's uh, probably better to use the ceramic implants and to make sure that the base uh, that they drill into your, into your jaw is the same material as the crown that they're going to put on it. So the ceramic ones seem to be safer. Um, I, you know, have a lot of people that actually react to metals. 
and I know myself when I was very sick and testing things, I was reacting to six or seven different kinds of me dental metals. So, um, so I do think the ceramic uh, ones, they're not quite as tough, but they're safer for the immune system. So that's what I would recommend because if you have a, a metal in the, in the, the core that goes into your jaw and then the covering is a different material, it can conduct current. If you use two different materials um, with the metals, they can conduct currents and then currents can cause degeneration over time. Okay, so I mean, if I look at the the exercise component of your protocol, and we have people that are listening and saying, okay, what do you, Dr. Toops, what do you consider to be an acceptable level of daily exercise or maybe several times weekly exercise for the average person to help prevent dementia and just for wellness uh, you know, overall? What, what would be a reasonable level? Yeah, I mean, I try to get people to think of exercise as something daily. Now, you're not going to do heavy training every day because your body needs to recover and over exercise can be as bad as no exercise. So, you know, you do need the sweet spot. And obviously that's going to depend on your age and your fitness level. But but definitely to at least get some movement every day. Uh, you know, I know it's been deadly for me with COVID, you know, being trapped at home and doing everything on the computer and not moving around as much. I think, you know, all kinds of horrors happen for that. So at a, at a very minimum, you know, do something every day that, you know, just to walk. I like, I live on a steep hill so I can go walk up and down my hill and get a pretty good, pretty good workout with that, you know, but, um, but at least some level of movement. I tell people, you know, you should plan to exercise at least six days a week because life is going to happen and probably one day a week something's going to happen and you're not going to be able to you know or you won't feel well or you know you were just on the go all day but trying to make it a daily practice of some sort just like you brush your teeth every day you know um, because if, if you plan on three times a week and you miss a day you're down to two times a week. no but let's define it a little bit closer some people like to train with weights they feel joy because they feel that they're getting stronger yes some people like to walk outside or to hike some people like to stretch or when right. we say the word exercise is a little general Right. So let's just say all of the above is important, just like with the gut. We say eat a variety of foods because the diversity of our gut microbiome is what's determining our health. So with exercise, you kind of need all of those things. So if you just do one thing every day, you're going to have one be adapted to one thing. For example, I had a patient in my study. He was a very good long distance runner. He had qualified that year for the Boston Marathon, which sadly didn't happen because of COVID. So he was working out with the trainer in the study, and I got the report saying he's not ready for high intensity interval training. And I said, what do you mean he can't do high intensity interval training? He's a runner. Okay, if I went out and ran like he does, I would that would be high intensity for me. And the trainer said, you don't understand. He's completely adapted to the, the running, um, but he said he has no core strength. So I'm having them work with him on developing his core muscle strength before I can push him to do some high intensity that's gonna raise his heart rate. So it's, it is different for everyone, but you know, especially with aging, it is very important to do some weight training, very, very important because, because as we lose our muscle strength, that's gonna increase our risk of falls. And I'm sure everybody knows somebody that's fallen and broken a hip and then one thing after another led to their demise. You know, it's, it's a horrific thing. So, you know, falls in the elderly can lead to death quite easily and certainly to disability. So, you know, keeping your muscles strong. So that means doing some weight training and it doesn't mean heavy weight lifting. You know, you can buy exercise bands and do resistance. You know, um, there's, there's all kinds of 
there's all kinds of great free exercise videos and some for older people. I mean, you don't, you don't have to go to a gym to exercise. I mean, it really should be available for everyone. So, so really, I think you should do a combination. You should at a minimum walk, you should do some strength training. You should, you know, do something that gets your heart rate up a little bit, a couple of times a week. And, um, and you should definitely do something for balance training as well. Well, Kat, we could stay here for six hours. You're a, <laughs> you're a treasure trove of information, but I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be on our show. The information here is not only useful for people who are scared about dementia, but let me just ask you before I let you go one question. Yeah. From time to time, every person will, will encounter something where, what's the name of that movie? What's the name? It's on the tip of my tongue, but I can't remember it. Right. How frustrating. How worried should people be from moments like that? Yeah, senior moments is what we call those, right? Yeah, and, and so, you know, but senior moments can happen to younger people as well. Um, so something like that, if it's an isolated thing occasionally, like I wouldn't worry about that. But if, if, if you find that you're having enough trouble that it starts to affect your functioning, you know, that's a, that's a different thing. And, and there, we talked about mild cognitive impairment, which is an actual diagnosis, but there's subjective cognitive impairment that comes first. When you start to feel like you're having a problem with your memory, I think you're having a problem with your memory and you should get that investigated because to, Dementia, as we know, it probably starts at least 20 years before people manifest the dementia. Well, COVID, uh, people who had COVID sometimes complain about brain. brain fog, of course, we talked about, but it's more senior moments now. Right. Is That could be temporary. We, we can't be sure about that. Right, right. We hope it's temporary, but we're definitely seeing a plethora of people, um, some manifesting frank dementia after having the COVID virus. We know that the COVID virus goes right after our blood vessels, right? It's destroying the blood vessels. It's causing a lot of microclots, and it's probably destroying the lining of the blood vessels. We're seeing very high rates of heart heart attacks and strokes with increased risk up to a year after COVID. So um, needing to do things, you mentioned the nitric oxide earlier, but you know things that we can do to help our blood flow and our blood vessels after having COVID, I think are very important. So I've been uh, recommending, uh, there's, there's, um, there's some supplements that help the, it's called the glycocalyx, the lining inside the blood vessels. And, uh, and so there's a couple of supplements that will help rebuild that glycocalyx lining. And then I think it's important for people to take some kind of blood thinners um, because the risk of clotting and hypercoagulability is so high. So uh, generally these days, we don't recommend prophylactic baby aspirin for most people with heart disease with certain conditions people need it if they have stents and things like that. But you know, there's a risk when you take aspirin of GI bleeds and, you know, so that's something, of course, that we especially want to avoid with aging. But there's some supplements called natokinase um, that's derived from soy, but they purify out the soy. So if you're allergic to soy, you can still take it. And lumbrokinase, they get something from silkworms. Um, but these are proteolytic enzymes that actually can give blood thinning. Taking a lot of fish oil can help to thin the blood a little bit. So um, I definitely think that after people have, you know, people have had COVID that they probably should be doing something to help, you know, the blood flow and the lining of the blood vessels. So I suspect some of that is what's happening in the brain as well. Um, you know, as you know, we're seeing so many people suddenly have strokes, heart attacks, and or dementia from COVID. So it's definitely uh, not an inconsequential infection for sure. Well, Kat, I want to thank you so much for taking the time and being on our show. I'm sure a lot of the information will be very useful to a lot of people. But more importantly, there is the message of hope yeah. that by doing very simple things that we are supposed to be doing anyway for our health, right. it can minimize, even reverse and improve brain degeneration, dementia, according to what you say. And I think that ray of hope is quite nice to know. 
uh, you know, about. So thank you so much and looking forward to seeing you soon. Yes, thank you so much for helping me get this message out. And I'll just conclude by saying what I hope everyone will continue to remember that dementia is not a death sentence. There's so much you can do about it. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you for joining me today for the second part of our amazing interview. If you didn't catch part one, don't miss out. The link is in the description below for you. And be sure to click the subscribe button for more videos.